begin to get comfortable in your seats. Please relax and prepare yourselves for our beloved Reverend John. Thank you, Jennifer, and I was a bit distracted because our other new temple baby just arrived, Jen, and of course we have betrothed him to Isabel, so um, it's all arranged. <laughs> Blessings. Good morning, friends, and just want to add my own words of welcome and to say how wonderful it is to, to look out and see your faces shining with love and to see some people who are an important part of my history, Elaine Wint Leslie, who, who, you know, it's just... We go, we go back a long way. Um, so just welcome to the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. My spiritual sister is here, Serena. And I love Jennifer's talk about peace this morning because, of course, that's her name, truly serene. A special welcome, too, to those who join us in consciousness on the World Wide Web. I want to share with you one of my favorite Christmas stories. It's by an unknown author, and it's titled, A Brother Like That. So listen up. A friend of mine named Paul received an automobile from his wealthy brother as a Christmas present. On Christmas Eve, when Paul came out of his office, a dirty, scruffy little boy was walking around the shiny new car, admiring it. Is this your car, mister? He asked. Paul nodded and said, yes, my brother gave it to me for Christmas. <gasps> the boy was astonished. You mean your brother gave it to you and it didn't cost you nothing? <laughs> boy, <laughs> I wish. And he hesitated. Of course, Paul knew what the boy was going to wish for. He was going to wish that he had a brother like that. But he had a surprise in store for him. The little boy, what the little boy said, jarred Paul all the way down to his heels. I wish, the little boy said, that I could be a brother like that. Paul looked at the boy in astonishment and then impulsively said, would you like to have a ride in my, in, my, in my new car? Yes, I'd love that, said the boy. And so after a short ride, the boy's eyes on stalks, as you can imagine, he turned and with his eyes aglow, he said, Mister, would you mind driving in front of my house? Paul smiled a little. He thought he knew what the little boy wanted. He wanted to show his neighbors that he could ride around in a big, expensive automobile. But Paul was wrong again. Will you stop where those two steps are? The boy asked. He got out and ran up the steps. And in a couple of minutes, Paul heard him coming back. But he wasn't walking fast. He was carrying his little crippled brother. He sat his brother down on the bottom step and then squeezed up against him and pointed to the car. There she is, buddy. There she is, just like I told you. His brother gave it to him for Christmas, and it didn't cost him a cent. And someday, I'm going to give you one just like that. And then, then you'll be able to see for yourself the pretty things in the Christmas windows that I've been trying to describe to you and to tell you all about. Paul got out and lifted the crippled boy to the front seat of his car. And the shining-eyed older brother climbed in beside him, and the three of them took off on a memorable holiday ride, looking at all those pretty things. That Christmas Eve, Paul learned the real meaning of the words, it's more blessed to give than receive. And he also learned that the most precious gift is truly the gift of self. And so I've entitled my encouragement, as I call my Sunday talks, The Gift of Self. You know, I love giving gifts. And when I was younger, I would expend a lot of time and energy, not to mention money, on obtaining the perfect gift 
for those I love at Christmas. But I had one Christmas a most embarrassing experience. You see, I had an aunt who gave me a pair of plain socks and five shillings every year. No matter how old I got, I got a pair of socks and five shillings. Which was a lot of money in those days, now I think about it. But the pair of socks were plain. Now you know where I have my penchant for. <laughs> socks appeal. <laughs> well, one year, I gave the plain pair of brown socks to my playmate next door. And on Christmas Eve, he brought them over and said, Johnny, you gave me the wrong gift. This one has a tag that says, from Aunt Tiny. <laughs> but I kept the five shillings. <laughs> it was years, in fact, thank God for the Christmas bazaar at the temple, because it's only when we had the bazaar that I began to get rid of presents that I wasn't ever going to use. <laughs> you know, um, it cured me of re-gifting. But friends, the gifts we exchange at Christmas are actually representative of the givingness of infinite spirit, which unceasingly provides for each and every one of us. These gifts of spirit are, of course, more lasting, more substantial than material gifts because they offer us spiritual nourishment. The nourishment of inner peace and spiritual warmth that comes from deep faith in the God presence that resides within all human beings, and in fact, within all life kind. The philosopher Fichte once said that an insight into the absolute unity of man with the divine is the profoundest knowledge that man can attain. The great gift then that Jesus gave to humankind was the revelation that we are all the sons and daughters of a living God. He grew up to be the way shower and our Christ nature was the way shown. The master teacher said that the first commandment is to love the Lord thy God, what? With all thy heart, mind and soul and with all thy strength. And the second commandment is like unto it. Help me. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, if we are to love our neighbor as ourselves, we first have to grasp the truth that our true self is an individualization of God. This means that we are in microcosm all that God is in macrocosm. In fact, I love it. The Sufi, um, 13th century Sufi poet Hafiz says, we're all God in drag, <laughs> dressed up as men, a, a, a woman doing all thing. So we love our neighbor by seeing in them, as in ourselves, the evolving and indwelling and everlasting spirit of God. We cannot do this, my friends, if we are harboring feelings of resentment, hurt, or enmity, toward anyone. For when we do this, we are actually dissing God. If everybody is a, an individualization of God and you are holding them in enmity, then you are actually holding God in enmity or a part of God. So the greatest gift you can give is really the gift of forgiveness. The gift of forgiveness. And it's a hard one to wrap up and hand out. Which brings me to your assignment. Right up front, right here, at the beginning of my encouragement, you have your assignment. Your mission, should you decide to undertake it, is to give the gift of forgiveness to anyone who you believe has hurt or offended you this past year. Sit down this afternoon and silently calling their name, say, I forgive you. I forgive you. I wish for you the glory of the season, for the Christ belongs to everyone. I wish for you the glory of the season, for the Christ belongs to everyone. And then say, with a little smile in your lips, something wonderful is happening to you and through you right now. 
something wonderful is happening to you and through you right now. And as I look at your faces, I can see that as I'm speaking, something wonderful is happening to you and through you right now. So please turn to your neighbor and say, I wish for you the glory of the season, for the Christ belongs to everyone. I wish for you the glory of the season, for the Christ belongs to everyone. Something wonderful is happening to you and through you right now. Something wonderful is happening to you and through you right now. Something wonderful is happening. You know, I had an email this morning from a friend in New York who said, pray, because there's, there's unrest again. Two policemen, uh, two cops got, got shot or hurt or injured or killed, I'm not certain what. And he said, pray. And I just thought, wow, yes, this is the gift we can give the world, the gift of the prayer of peace. At our concert, Hallelujah, this evening, Rhonda Lumsden Lu will be the soloist in the eternal and much loved Oh Holy Night. And it occurred to me as I was thinking about this that the angel voices that this beautiful song urges us to hear those angel voices represent our highest thoughts, thoughts of love and forgiveness. And somebody wise said, the full inn where Mary hoped to give birth represents our full egos which have no room for this new childlike though royal notion of truth. The full inn represents our full egos but has no time for this little, li little new birth of something so exquisite and so beautiful and so tender that it has changed the course of human history. I don't, it doesn't matter to me whether it was actually the, 20, the 25th of December or it was in the middle of the spring or you know, whether he was born in a stable. You know that there's nowhere in the Bible that says that there were animals around the stable. The romance of the, the many years after the birth of Jesus the romantic said, well, if he was born in a stable, there must have been oxen and goats. And it's a lovely, a lovely um, story and legend, but it doesn't matter because that wasn't the point. The point was the gift of self that he brought, the gift of the truth of our divinity, that we are indeed the sons and daughters of God. Just think about that. The same angels, the same messengers of truth or higher thoughts that sang then are singing now as we prepare to celebrate another Christmas. And this is the Christ principle. For the Christ wasn't a person. Jesus Christ wasn't like John Scott or John Christ. It wasn't his last name. The Christ was the principle of sonship and daughtership that resides in each and every one of us. You know, Lord Krishna, born a prince in India thousands of years before Jesus, said, and I quote, he who perceives me everywhere and beholds everything in me never loses sight of me, nor do I lose sight of him, unquote. In a similar metaphor, Jesus expresses the same truth in these words, and I quote, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? and one of them shall not fall on the ground without the sight of your father. Matthew 10, verse 29. This then is the promise of the beloved. I am never out of sight of that child of mine who always thinks of me and looks for me everywhere. Can we do that this Christmas? Can we look for the presence of Christ everywhere? in everybody we meet, in every person that we pass on the streets, including the, the white deportee that bad drive me this morning as I was coming to church, I had to remind myself that there, there goes somebody who has the Christ potential deep within them. Have you ever wondered why Jesus came when he did? Have you ever thought about that? Why did Jesus choose that time to come? You know, Eric Butterworth, who was one of the New Thought luminaries of yesteryear, said, and I quote, he came because of the belief in duality. The belief in duality was a great dividing wall that kept people feeling separate from God. And that, incidentally, is 
the, the meaning behind the, the rending of the veil of the temple on the day of the crucifixion. He said the, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. It meant that the dividing wall between humanity and spirituality was pulled down forever, never to again be rebuilt. So Butterworth says, yet humans have always had a deep, inner, intuitive feeling about a higher power. And it is this inner longing for something greater that has been reflected in every religion, in every ritual, and every form of worship throughout human history. This longing for God has built temples and cathedrals. It has lit the sacred fires as man yearned for light. This longing for God has informed every creed and it has been the context of every prayer. And it is this longing for God I believe that led our beloved Dr. Elmer to build this temple and name it Temple of Light. Well, she led so many people to the discovery of the light within themselves. So Jesus' discovery of the innate divinity in us all brought down this great dividing war, this veil between God and humankind. Ralph Waldo Emerson says of Jesus, and I quote, alone in human history, he estimates the greatness of man. One man was true to what is in me and you. He saw that God incarnates himself in man and evermore goes forth anew to take possession of the world, unquote. Jesus discovered his own unique relationship with the infinite, and in so doing, he discovered his divinity and ours. And so friends, when we celebrate Christmas, we are really acknowledging the Christ's potential in ourselves. As practitioners of the science of mind, we do not worship Jesus the man. We follow his teachings because we know that when he says, follow me, he is really referring to our acceptance of the high level of consciousness that he achieved. The awakening of our spiritual magnificence does not have to come as a soul of Tarsus experience in a blinding flash of light. I believe that we are all evolving into a greater awareness of the glory and greatness that created us out of itself and that bids us come up higher, come up higher in consciousness. Author Joan Borisenko, in her book Seven Paths to God, relates an old Jewish story, which I've shared before, but like all good teaching stories, it bears repeating. It's about a certain Mrs. Feingold who lives in Brooklyn. Well, one day she ups and calls her travel agent to book passage to a remote village in Nepal. He's shocked. Sophie, you have no idea what a schlep it is to get there. You have to take two planes, then a train across the Punjab where there's guerrilla warfare, and then go by camel for a week, and then there is no kosher food. Never mind, Ernie, she says, I've had a revelation and I'm going. So she loads her backpack full of rye bread and hard cheese. And after 10 days of strenuous travel, Sophie arrives at last in the camp of the great guru, only to discover that there is a three-week wait to see him. Seekers have come from all over the world to find the meaning of life, to rid themselves of illness and depression, and to have a profound mystical experience in his presence. Furthermore, she is told that when she does have an audience with him, she can say only three words. Sophie, not to be dismayed, settles down and waits with great patience. I hope, like me, she probably she didn't leave home without her needlepoint. At last, the big moment arrives. They remind her of the attendants that she must utter only three words to the Holy One. And they usher her into a cave, redolent of incense and twinkling with the lights of a thousand candles. In the back of the cave is a bearded man in saffron robes, eyes half closed in a state of transcendental bliss. Upon seeing him, Sophie's whole body pulses with recognition, and she is filled with indescribable joy. 
rushing forward, she grabs him by the shoulders, shakes him back to awareness, and looking straight into his eyes with a look of triumph, she cries, Morris, come home! <laughs> The whole point of this pithy Jewish teaching story is that mystical experience is not necessarily found just in the heights of visionary experience, in monasteries, ashrams, or in living the life of a saint. Very few people have sold of Tarsus experiences. Oneness with God is found at home right where we live in the daily pursuit of our lives. I've experienced it working in my garden I've experienced it blessing a baby here in this sanctuary. I've experienced it in the booming, newly acquired baritone of one of my teenagers hailing me at the food court at Sovereign saying, Sup, Uncle John? <laughs> you can experience the Christ presence everywhere. I ran into Harrison yesterday um, out shopping and I experienced it right there. Wow, you know, all of the innocence and, and beauty of a child and all the excitement of Christmas. I caught the, the spark. So thank you, Harrison, he, uh, he's upstairs with Auntie, Auntie Carmen. Borisenko puts it this way. The true measure of spirituality is about being what the Jews call a mensch, a human being in the fullest sense of the word. I am truly grateful that our teaching, the science of mind, does not require that I have to go somewhere to find God. I'm glad, too, that I don't have to rely on someone other than myself to channel God's power to me. And I really thank Dr. Elmer for that. She said, if anybody tells you that they have the answer, run in the opposite direction, because you have the answer. And I'm especially grateful that Spirit called me to ministry without requiring that I have to become someone I am not. In John 1:14, we read, and I quote, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. John was, of course, referring to the Christed Jesus, the Jesus who discovered his and our sonship with God. For Christ, as we have said, is not a person. Christ is the degree of stature that Jesus attained, and it is the degree of the potential stature in every human being. And so, ultimately, each of us must fulfill this mystic utterance for ourselves, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You might want to just contemplate that this evening after you do your forgiveness exercise. Journal, what does the word becoming flesh in your life look like and feel like for you? What would your life be like? How different would it be if the word that you spoke, and it does, become flesh instantly, without any delay? Can you imagine if every time you said bless you to someone, it instantly became a reality in their lives, in their bodies, in their central nervous system, in their immune system, in their hearts, in their consciousness. Wow! And the word became flesh. What an awesome thought. What a gift. So this week, my friends, as you wrap each gift, first check to ensure that there isn't a tag in it from Aunt Tony. <laughs> And then as you wrap each gift, affirm for the recipient, you are the Christ in Christmas. Thank you for the gift of yourself. My prayer for each of you is that you will recognize and live from a deeper understanding of this powerful principle of the Christ indwelling as you share the glorious gift of yourself with your world. Let us say together, the Christ is born in me today. Together. The Christ is born in me today. I am the Christ in Christmas. I am the Christ in Christmas. And this is my gift to my world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this is my gift to my world. Hallelujah. To your neighbor say, you are the Christ in Christmas. Thank you for the gift of yourself. Hallelujah. You are the Christ in Christmas. Thank you for the gift of yourself. Hallelujah.
You are indeed, my beloved friends, the Christ in Christmas. Thank you for the gift of yourselves. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.